morning to one of my favorite passages in Scripture, and that is John chapter 13. Howard Hendricks tells a story about a man who had a dream, and in his dream he was at the great banquet feast in heaven. And there were people seated on both sides of this long table with every marvelous food spread out before them. And there was just one little problem. Everyone had their arms tied to boards so they couldn't bend their elbows. And so try as they might, they, they could get food, but they couldn't get it to their mouths. Until one person got some food, reached across the table, and put it in the mouth of the person across from them. And that person returned the favor, and pretty soon everybody was enjoying the banquet feast of the Lord. I like that picture because it is a picture of serving others rather than serving yourself. So let's take a look. John chapter 13, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 15 to be, oh, uh, well, actually 1 to 5 to begin with. <clears throat> John 13. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave the world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Let's pray. Father, show us the lesson. Teach us to serve. Empower us to love. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a powerful lesson here that Jesus is doing on purpose. The hour is quickly running out for him. The sands of the hourglass is passing by. He only has that night, pretty much, really, to minister to his people, to prepare them. And in John's Gospel here, the next several chapters is all compressed into that evening, that Passover meal, his prayer for them, his prayer in the garden, and then his arrest. Jesus said no greater love has one than to lay down his life for his friends, and that's what he's preparing to do. And I like that after he said that, he then turned to his disciples and said, you are my friends if you do what I say. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes on him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's what love is. Love is not, I feel so good for you. Love is, I do for you. One of the problems I have when I counsel with couples is they'll tell me they love one another, but then they're forever fighting. Love is doing. It's not just feeling. Or the other part of that is, oh, I don't feel any love anymore. Well, perhaps it's because you're not doing love. You can't just... Your feelings change. You can't just rely on that. Love is what you do, and that's what God showed us. He loved the world so that he gave his son. He did. Now, this little phrase here, he loved them to the end. Actually, a better translation might be he loved them completely. He showed his love completely for what he did for them. Now, Satan had already entered into Judas, already got him ready for that. What? What's going on? How did Judas fall into this trap? Was he a cheat and a creep and a jerk from the beginning? Well, we're not exactly told. Was he simply evil? He was stealing from the bag. We know that. The, the, the Gospels tell us that. But what it is, is Judas... He wanted to follow God. He was trying to follow the Messiah. He was doing this. But Judas had this little problem. My will be done, not thy will be done. 
Judas put himself before God. And you and I can do that too. When we make that decision, I want this and it doesn't matter if God says no, because I want it, you are opening yourself for the evil one to twist you and turn you. My will be done is always destructive. It looks like a good thing, because I get what I want. But in doing that, instead of seeking God's will, we destroy ourselves and we open ourselves to the evil one. So, the supper's over. Jesus gets up and uh, does something that Mike Rowe would call a dirty job. Takes off his robe, puts on a towel, begins to wash his disciples' feet. Now here's what's going on. It's normally a servant's job to do this. And normally it should have been done before they ate. What happens is, in that, in that world, uh, and I get a taste of it every time we go down to Mexico, uh, you take a bath, you get washed up, you get cleaned up, and then you go out into the streets and you're wearing sandals and you're walking through the dust and the dirt and the garbage which everybody threw out their windows into the street. And when you get somewhere, well, your feet are kind of dirty. And not only that, when you and I sit down around a table to eat, we're sitting at chairs like you're in now, but in that culture, they reclined on a couch and the couches were angled around the table so that your feet were by someone's head. And so, normally, in a nice dinner party situation, a servant would come when you came through the door and wash your feet off so that everybody would be sweet-smelling lying around the table there. Now, every single one of them disciples thought about that when they came in and laid down with somebody's smelly feet by their feet. But, every single one of them made this decision. I'm not doing that. I'm too important to do that. I'm not going to submit myself to servitude before these other guys. But here's the key, and here's the lesson for us out of this passage in chapter 13. Submission is the key to godliness. It's in a relationship husband and wife relationship, in the church body. I don't want that. Submission is the key to godliness. Philippians tells us that Jesus humbled himself even to death on the cross. And because of that, God exalted him. That's the key. That's the key to living a life that God honors and that honors God and that other people see and say, wow, how can I have a life like that? But the problem is, we are just exactly like these men around the table there. If I got up and washed everybody's dirty feet, they're all going to look down on me. They're going to think, oh, there's John, the loser. Should have been sitting at the end of the table so he could wash my feet. But in fact, Jesus himself got up and did that dirty job. When you act like Jesus, others see Jesus mirrored in you. Verse 6. He came to Simon Peter who said... Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, Peter said, You'll never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that's why he said, not everyone was clean. Now, again, don't miss the picture here of what's going on. Jesus took off his rabbinical robe, his robe of authority, 
and he stripped down and put on a servant's towel. Now, you need to understand what that means. The servant's towel was pretty much a diaper. He just wrapped around it with the long end hanging down the front. So you are then washing and drying people's feet with the garment you're wearing. If that's not a symbol of servitude, I don't know what is. I don't think anybody in this room would jump up and go, me, me. That's, that's just degrading. Really? Is service servile? Jesus said, you don't understand what I'm doing, but you will. He's teaching a very important lesson here. But wait a minute. This is God in the flesh. What does he think he's doing? It's, this is menial. This is slave labor. It's beneath the dignity of the Son of God. Did you all see President Bush take the ice bucket down? Oh, it was very funny. He, he's sitting at a table and he says, I've been challenged to take the ice bucket challenge, but I don't think it's very presidential to be doused with cold water. So I'm just going to write a check. And then Laura dumped the bucket on <laughs> She says, the check's for me. <laughs> but I, he's, he's using humor there, as he often did, to, to make his point. Not presidential. But then he did it anyway. He was in on it. It's not presidential for the Son of God to wash people's dirty feet. And yet he did it. Peter sees the degradation. Lord, you're not going to wash my feet, are you? Yep. Well, then do everything. Poor Peter. Even Jesus tells him, you're not going to understand it yet, but you will. And he still argues with him. No, no. So then he piles on more work. Well, wash my head and my hands too. Do everything. And Jesus is right. He doesn't get what's going on. He's just shocked by the picture of it. What? Jesus can't do that for me. I should have been doing that for him. And see, that's when he starts to get the point. And here's the lesson for me and you. Don't get your exercise jumping to conclusions. Oftentimes, God is teaching us a lesson that we look at it and we go, no, God, you're wrong. That, that can't be right. And yeah, you're right. It can't be right. We're missing something. And so oftentimes it takes hindsight to look back and go, oh, oh, is that what God was doing? Is that what the point was? Peter didn't get it. But like too many of us, he argues with God instead of assuming God knows what he's doing. Boy, how many times have I done that? God, if you just understood, you wouldn't ask me to do this. Ah. Okay, so Jesus says, no, I'm not going to wash your face and your head, or your head and your hand. Those who have had a bath only need to have their feet washed. Uh, you're clean, and all of you are clean, he says. Now, literally, what he's saying is, you've had a bath and only your feet are dusty. So what? That's what it is. That's the literal understanding. You, here he says, you are clean. That's a plural you. So he's referring to all the disciples, and he's referring to you and I as well in that. John makes the point that he's not referring to Judas, because <laughs> he knew he was lying. But the literal interpretation is, you've had a bath and only your feet are dusty. But there's an application, a spiritual teaching in that, and that is, I have cleansed you wholly, but everyday living brings new dirt to be cleansed. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We fall into that. Daily living does that. And so he's just saying, confess it. Get it out before the Lord. So, on to verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes 
and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. Now when I first started taking speech classes, I minored in speech and drama in college, one of the things they told us in preparing a message was, you should tell people what you're going to tell them, and then you should tell them, and then you should tell them what you've told them. Jesus did not subscribe to that school of teaching. Sit down, you don't understand what I'm doing, you will later. Then he does it, and after he's done, he tells them what he's done. He doesn't say, now Peter, here's what I'm, here's the lesson I want you to learn. And then do it, and then say, did you get it? He just doesn't do that. He sit down, shut up, you'll know later, and then he does it, and then he says, do you understand? That's the way he did it. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to do it all that way. I, the point is, Jesus just had a different style. So after he's done, it says, he takes his robe, puts it back on, and I like John's wording. He Then he takes his place. What is his place? It's the head of the table. It's the rabbi. It's the master. That picture, taking off his robe, putting on the servant's towel, washing their feet, putting his robe back on, and sitting down and taking his place, that is the picture of everything Jesus did. He left the splendor of heaven. He became one of us, put on a servant's towel. He served. And then when he was done with his service, he put back on his master's robe and resumed his place. Right there in a, in a little picture. And that's why I think he told Peter, you don't understand now, but you will later. He, everything that he did for them was done in that one little act. Jesus never stopped being the Son of God when he washed their dirty feet. He never stopped being the Son of God when he touched the leper. He never stopped being the Son of God when he blessed the children who were wasting his time. He never stopped being the Son of God when he hung on the cross. He never stopped being the Son of God when he wept and, and prayed in the garden and sweat dropped like blood. He never stopped. So that he could do what he had to do for us without losing who he was. And that's the lesson for you and I. Jesus said, if I can do that, what about you? Now God is fond of questions as a teaching tool. Adam, where are you? Where is your brother Abel? What are you doing here, Elijah? The point in all of those instances, and I, I did a series a couple years ago, if you remember, about questions God asks. The point is, God knows where Adam is. God knew where Abel was. And God knew why Elijah was there. He wanted them to stop and think, yeah, what am I doing? What is my spiritual condition? What is my relationship to God? Because in all of those instances, their relationship to God has changed because of what they have done. Jesus asked them, do you know what I've done for you? If I, the Lord and Master, can humble myself and wash your dirty feet, don't you think you should do that? Now, does he mean that literally? Is Jesus saying, well, I'm, I've told you to baptize in my name, and I've told you to remember me with the Lord's Supper, but you also need to do foot washing. You know, the Brethren Church, they practice foot washing as an ordinance. Is that wrong? Or is that they are the only ones who write and everybody else is wrong? Well, I, I wouldn't say they're wrong. Jesus said to do it. But I don't think he was specifically, literally saying, in your services when you have worship time, you should stop and have foot washing. I don't think that's what he meant. There's nothing wrong with doing that. 
Because it's a good remembrance, just like the Lord's Supper is a good remembrance. But what I really think he said was, you ought to have this attitude of service to one another. He said in another place, the greatest of you should be the servant of all. He's talking about our attitude, that I'm not so wonderful that I can't bend down and do something for you. My brother once wrote uh, lyrics to a song that said, I'm so glad I serve a God who's not afraid to kneel. Imagine the magnitude of that picture if you had never thought about that before. That God himself would kneel down before your dirty feet. Willingly. Because that's what he did. If I, if you see a need, what it means is we ought to do something about it. That needs to be taken care of. Oh, look, they they cleaned the building here, but they didn't scrub out the toilet. Somebody should do something about that. Yeah, if I see a need, I should take care of it. I should do something about it. The world says masters are to be served. Jesus says masters serve. You know what I've done for you? You ought to also do this for one another. Let's pray. Father, this is one lesson we can take to heart. This is one lesson we can do. Help us, Father, to have a heart of service. Help us, Father, to have an attitude like Jesus. That we're, we're not better than others, but that we are strong enough in you to serve others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.